negative here, okay? And then once it's in here, in that periplasmic space, it may float around in the space, um, and then it may go in through an active transport system. Now, this could be either a specific system designed for um, whatever molecule it may be, um, in this case, glucose. We'll still say, say it could be a specific system for glucose. It could be a sim port system for glucose. Um, this advantage of having this periplasmic space is that it's real easy to get a high concentration gradient high concentration gradient in because it's such a small space. So it's pretty easy to get stuff to the inner uh, inside of the cell where there's a lower concentration gradient uh, passively without having to use ATP. Um, but in this case, it is an active transport system, which is kind of misleading because usually it uses a, I'll just do it in white here, symport, which is a, f a form of active transport, but it's a secondary form. Whereas the ton B dependent receptors are highly, highly specific. So I have something, um, well, it will just say uh, vitamin B12, okay? It's going to go through here, and then as a, through a series of, it's just like relaying it in here, again, through conformational change. It doesn't, this B12, you're not going to be able to find this floating too long in the periplasmic space. So that's, a, I guess, the main difference that I wanted to drive home. If you don't remember anything else, just remember porin, broad, ton B, specific. Okay, so keep in mind that there is no... ATP in the periplasm, and therefore most structures use the conformational change of ions or protons driving down their concentration gradients. Because again, going back here, it's such a small space, it's really easy to do that, and it'd be kind of metabolically you know, useless to do so. Okay, so there's one other way. That's how we get things in. Now let's talk about how we get things out. Well, there's type 3 secretion proteins, and if it's a secretion or a secretion system, that just means it's a complex of proteins, but if it's a secretion system, it's going to be secreting things. Just keep in mind, we're still talking about gram negative here. Okay, So this exports a protein that doesn't have a hydrophobic signal recognition particle. It uses a small molecular hypodermic needle made of proteins evolutionarily related to flagellin. Um, anything that is an sticks out of a bacterial cell, whether it's a fimbriae or a pilus, these aren't the same thing. These are just hollow protein tubes or cones in this context. So what it does is, if we could get this to move in here, all right, so this diagram here over here down in the left is the type 3 secretion system. And what we have is a series of polypeptides. And then, as you can see, it goes through. This is our periplasm of one space, space of another. And then let's just say that this is a, a I don't know, something that we wanted to secrete a protein into to either help form uh, a biofilm or uh, we say that this is a host cell. We want to get rid of it. Uh, bacteria making us sick. So it's going to channel through this long series of secretions uh, whatever protein it needs to into directly into the host cell cytoplasm. And the reason why I remember that these are, if you'll go back, these are all hydrophobic molecules. That's actually a bad drawing there. But they're hydrophobic, so we don't want them just floating around in this space because all life originated from water, so it's going to want to spend as little time in water as possible. It's also really nice in that it shows how this works, and right next to it is a flagella subunit, flagellum being made out of flagellin. They really couldn't have chosen better protein uh, context. But I guess the point that I'm making is that anything that's uh, sticking out of a cell is really just a hollow protein tube. Okay, so cool. Ah, that's too far. No. Oh. Ah. Okay, so now let's just talk about the bacterial exterior. And then there's fimbriae, which these are, um, again, just protein out, uh, outpouches here, but their prim primary function is to attach, aid in attachment. So, you know, um, a lot of uh, enterobacterium, enterobacterium, These are this word just means that it's a bacteria that lives inside your intestine, such as E. coli. They have this to help them stick to that uh, intestinal wall. And then also helps them with something called gliding motility. 
and I can never do my eyes on this thing for some reason. Okay, so that's uh, what that is. And then uh, the other form of, or another type of it is a pilus. A, a more commonly called a sex pilus. <laughs> because it aids in bacterial conjugation. And usually most people, or most microbiologists, will specifically say that there's a difference between the two, functionally and structurally. But for a lot of people, they use the terms fimbriae and pilus interchangeably. Uh, I don't like that because one has a very different job to do than the other, but oh well. Again, all three of these are just hollow protein tubes. I'll do this down here in white. They're all just hollow protein tubes. Okay. This aids in bacterial conjugation. And what this is is the exchange of plasmids, which we've talked about before, I believe. And that's what that does. Okay. Now let's just talk about something that both Fimbriae and pilus have in common, and I'll do that in, I guess, white, and I'll put it right here. Um, they both serve as an attachment for antibodies. And I'm going to circle that in red so that we can be sure that I'm talking about something different from what I put down there at the bottom. Okay, now we'll talk about one last thing with Fimbriae is that they have a molecule called adhesin. How wonderful. So if it ends in an IN, you know that it's a protein and what is the action that it does? Well, it's adhesive, which is nice because what is one of the things that it does? Attachment. And the reason why I really wanted to drive home the point of this is that it's used medicinally Um, in something called any type of a quick clotting substance. So say I get a cut across my arm and I just get a, basically a pair of gauze and apply it on there and then cover it. And this will help kind of help that wound close up much faster. Um, I don't know how much of that's actually used, but I used to work in EMS and um, it was used a lot in the military. And then a flagella which I don't know how to really exemplify this more so than just say that uh, we've already talked about it, but it is also a hollow protein tube that is kind of a propeller like of a motion here. So uh, it's totally different. Um, it is not related to the eukaryotic one. Okay, bacteria flagella are completely different from eukaryotic flagella. It's not something um, that's a result of having a similar genetic. This is a result of convergent evolution, if we were to say. So, the only way I can think of to explain this is with my hand. <laughs> so, archaea or bacterial uh, flagella is a propeller motion. Okay, eukaryotic is a whip like motion, like a sperm. Okay, so sperm use whips, bacteria use propellers. Not any way related between the two. So, cool. Um, and then this is just kind of a picture here, again, showing those. These right here, this would be a... This really would be a fimbriae. Peluses are much, much larger, but they can aid in uh, the bacteria. If it doesn't have one of these, it can kind of walk along the way. Lastly, I want to talk about the word trich. This is Latin for hair. So if I have a mono trich us bacterium, it has one flagella. This is a monotrichous bacteria. If it had, I'll do it in green. Let's say another flagella over here, and then another one all over its body. This would be a peritrichus, and you can keep going on the other. Although sometimes they use the word lofo. I don't quite know what that means in Greek, but there you go. Okay, so one other thing that bacteria can do, and this kind of scares me, but at the same time, it's kind of cool. So let's just say that this is a cell in my intestine. I, uh, I don't know why I've been talking about intestine so much, but there's a cell in my intestine, and then there's a bacteria here, 
okay? And this is a bacteria that's making people sick. So we'll say Shigella or, uh, so the, you know, dysentery. Okay, so certain bacteria, not all, but certain ones, can cause host cells to produce actin filaments that will contract to bring them to the interior of their cells, of their host cells, evading immune response. So this bacteria and the molecular biology behind this I can't comprehend. I tried to. I looked it up on uh, some online stuff, and ugh, it's so confusing. But basically, the bacteria sends out a signal that goes in through a signal transduction pathway or through an intracellular receptor, causes the host eukaryote to produce actin filaments that are going to come out and attach to it. So it comes out, and these things here attach to it, and then they contract and actually pull the bacterium inside the host cell. So let's just say that I'm a, I'm a macrophage and I'm looking to eat him. You know, I'm looking to eat that bacterium. Well, he runs inside of a host cell. I'm not going to eat that host cell because as far as I know, I can't tell that he's inside there. And so that is disturbing to some extent. I'd like to think that, again, this could be used for medicinal purposes to say maybe help understanding the mechanism of how it works to deliver drugs or to deliver, um, you know, uh, help aid certain growth of certain areas. Um, just kind of the sky's the limit with that, but it is pretty scary <laughs> that bacteria can do this. So an example of this, I guess the best, most well-known is Shigella dysentery. Um, this is the bacterium that causes the disease dysentery, um, which is you die of very painful, horrible diarrhea and your body becomes dehydrated. So, let's see if there's a, yeah, there's a following here. So there is, uh, on the exterior, one last thing that they do have is um, they can form capsules. Not all of them have this, but some of them do. Um, although it's sometimes called glycocalyx, because I think this is a more accurate word, because it is a sugar-based compound. So when you're trying to do a capsule stain, you're not going to heat fix it. And what this does is it does, well, I mean, it protects against against phages and phagocytes. So this keeps the bacteria pretty well protected and what happens is they can actually clump together in forming uh, a biofilm which I'm just going to go ahead and draw on this next page here. So let's say that this is, uh, I'll do it in red. This, uh, which one? There. So this outer portion of the bacteria is the capsule made of glycocalyx. So say that this bacteria gets next to another bacteria and they start producing even more. And they form a biofilm. And then we'll say another bacterium comes into play and he starts producing more of this capsule. And then another one comes in and he starts producing more of a capsule. And before you know it, you have this big, massive slimy, grossy thing that's built up and deposited on, let's just say it's deposited on someone's tooth. Yeah, you have plaque built up on your teeth and that's what they are and they're going to just stay there and what they can do is they can, uh, I'll do this in uh, blue, in these biofilms they can undergo um, quorum sensing. Down here, Q. Quorum sensing, uh, which is where they're exchanging plasmids. Exchanging plasmids. So they're most likely to be, this is where you'll get a lot of antibiotic resistant bacteria. Um, and then they're also sharing nutrient source. It is, yeah, sharing nutrients. So they can, this is one of the things that they can do. And this is, uh, what has given rise to a lot of really nasty bacteria in a clinical setting.